All right. It's uh, 10 a.m. straight. So it's time to start the next session. Uh, this is the Western Asia session. I'm very happy to um, moderate the session. Um, and I'm looking forward to some really, really interesting talks. I'm Ruben. I'm a fish ecologist. I'm based in Berlin, Germany at the moment. And um, I would like to welcome everybody of you to this very, very unique event. We have more than 100 participants already. Uh, we have oscillated around 200 um, on the earlier sessions. And we, uh, we are very confident that we will reach that number again on, on even Excel, actually. Um, for the participants, it's very important for you to know that you can only see and listen. There's no way to share your screen, open your webcam, um, unmute your microphone or anything like that. But if you want to communicate with us, uh, for example, if you have questions, you can use the question and answer function, the question function uh, on the bottom of your interface. We have a question manager who is uh, Mark and Mark will monitor the question box constantly. Um, if you see a question that has already been asked, you can like it in order to uh, increase the significance of the question. And then it's more likely that we actually have, uh, that we actually choose to answer it because we have to limit ourselves to a few questions after each session. If you have a question, please uh, ask right away using the question function and not wait don't wait until the end of the talk, otherwise it's uh, a harder work for Mark to compile all the questions. So just shoot ahead. Um, if you have any other issue, you can use the chat function. We also have a chat manager. This is Roxanne and Roxanne will um, be monitoring the chat box constantly and help you with anything else that is not related to any questions uh, regarding the talks. Um, then Actually, this is already it from my side. I will now hand over the stage to Aryan, who is going to say a few words about this event and why it's so significant. And I'm very happy uh, to hear Aryan's little talk. Thank you very much, Aryan, for joining in. Thank you. And uh, we are looking forward to what you have to say. Well, um, let me um, start by telling how this started. It was uh, more or less a month ago. And Herman sent me an email. Um, what about doing a marathon webinar for 24 hours? And then we move along with the sun. So we adjust our talks to each time zone. And um, yeah, I discussed with colleagues and we were, we were enthusiastic. Let's do that, of course. Yes, nice. And then um, we were thinking about, ooh, this can be pretty conflict complex it's not easy to 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 have all the re different time zones have the right program etc so at a certain moment you thought oh how are we going to do this and it's so nice to see how it's now developing uh, before i continue i'm uh, i would like to know a little bit more about the people who are listening at the moment and and looking at us at the moment and uh, therefore we made a small uh, a little poll and let me just launch that now um, <clears throat> so people who are watching now you can uh, click on the answers we have three questions and um, uh, now we would like if you will will give your answer the first question is like do you what what is it that you really like is it fish or rivers nature everything second question is your about your professional background and we are curious if you plan to follow more sessions today so if you've answered them, uh, the questions you can then push on the button <clears throat> to, um, uh, yeah, to, to submit it. Um, okay, I see it's developing a little bit different than the previous sessions or not. Let me check. So I'll show you what uh, most people like fish, but above all, uh, most people like all of the above. Fish, rivers, nature, etc. Which I can imagine. Um, most people are scientists and students, um, uh, I can see. Although we also have policy makers, educators, business people present as well. And, um, and what I see is most people plan to follow more sessions per day today. Ah, that's really nice. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me tell a little bit more about the background for, uh, from this webinar. 
sharing my screen again. So my name is Arjan Berghuisen. I'm director of the World Fish Migration Foundation. We have a small team of enthusiastic people. You can see a photo here where we're sitting right to the Vezin Dam in, uh, in uh, France, which is actually removed already. It's a fantastic case. I mean, if you have a chance, you should go there. It was a huge uh, dam and now uh, with a very large reservoir. Um, and, and now it's, it's removed, being removed still uh, for the salmon to return there. Fantastic place, very inspiring, inspiring dam removal. Um, we have now a whole group of people who are involved with our foundation, not only the people who work there, but also we have volunteers, many, many people around it. And that actually started um, in 2014 when the foundation was uh, funded, founded by Herman and we organized at that time the first World Fish Migration Day with 270 events in more than 50 countries. That was quite amazing already, of course. And we, we uh, after that, <clears throat> continued all kinds of projects. We launched the Happy Fish Project. In 2016, there was the second World Fish Migration Day, even more events, 450 events in more than 60 countries. Um, uh, at that time, the organization also started dam removal Europe project, which I can tell a little bit more about later on. Um, after that, the, um, we got involved in the Ember project, a fantastic project with a lot of universities in Europe um, uh, mapping all the different uh, barriers in European rivers <clears throat> and see also what kind of solutions there are. Then in 2018, we organized a third World Fish Migration Day again. That is uh, in more than yeah, 500 events in, in 60 countries or 63 countries. We launched the second uh, uh, From Sea to Source guide about fish migration. You can still download that one. And now we started the Global Swimways Initiative. So um, it's a really nice development. We wanted to celebrate World Fish Migration Day, the fourth one on the 16th of May. But because of the COVID situation, that is extended to the 4th, 24th of uh, October. And in 10 years time, we want to celebrate at least one river opening per day. And in, in all these years, we gathered contacts of people around the world, also like yourselves at the moment. And uh, we have more than 10,000 contacts in all different continents, all people who enjoy this issue and, and uh, all people who seem eager to cooperate to improve the situation. And I think that's, that's really inspiring. Uh, and it's necessary because um, we are currently working on a new uh, report uh, of the Living Planet Index for migratory fish. And this is an index which shows how it's going with the certain species worldwide. This um, um, <clears throat> graph was made in 2016 uh, and showing a real decline from migratory fish in, in the last 40 years. But actually, we are making a new uh, version of this, uh, this index. And it's, it's, it's even more, it is worse. It's worse than, than, than we thought at the time. We'll come back to that in October. Then we have the, the specifics of that uh, new index. But it's clear there's something we need to do here. And <clears throat> therefore we thought, let's look at other um, sectors or other initiatives which show how to improve the situation. And then we thought the, the, the approach of the flyways of people protect, protecting migratory birds is quite stimulating, is quite inspiring. It's a concept that was uh, uh, developed in, in the 1930s by scientists in America. And they started mapping the migration routes of, of flying birds and, um, and started cooperating and changing information. And it was growing, growing as a new discipline. And it's one of the yeah, bases for the Ramsar Convention, which is uh, uh, done in 1971. And, and that convention is about protecting wetlands, which are important for these migratory birds. And, and now, in, in nowadays, there are even summits around flyways where countries cooperate together and, and make agreements how to save migratory birds. So that's, of course, what we want as well for fish. And one of the bases around this whole work is that the, the, the scientific basis is pretty good already about what are the migration routes of these birds? How is it looking? This is a picture from, from polar view, eh, from the North Pole. And it shows the main migration routes of these birds. 
And this is an inspiration for us to do that as well for fish. Um, we made a sort of a pre preliminary map a few years ago with the nice drawings about the main uh, migration routes, main swimways. Um, but now it's time to get that a little bit more detailed, a step further. We cooperate together with IUCN, the UNEP, Cambridge University, and uh, meanwhile also a lot of other university, university of Groningen and all other um, uh, uh, organizations to make a new map. This is a first uh, draft of that map. It's far complete, complete. We're still working on it. <clears throat> and yeah, uh, regretfully, it is clear that we need uh, a lot more information. With, um, with these swimways, we use criteria at the moment, like uh, the number of uh, uh, threatened species, but also the number of migratory species making use of such a swimway. And, and that way we try to define the global main swimways, but there's really, we lack uh, information. So we need to cooperate on this to get information from all of us all over the world. And we think that can really, really help. For example, uh, let's take the swimway of the, of the European eel. Uh, the, this is the European eel, amazing creature being born in the middle of the sea of the Sargasso Sea, then it floats towards uh, Europe, then goes on onto rivers and goes really inland, um, uh, grows in 20 years times more or less, and then when it's old enough it goes back to, uh, to, breed again, to spawn again. And what is so nice about this story is that um, this animal uh, has all kinds of threats in all different places. It starts when it arrives in Europe, it starts to be almost be caught by Spanish fishermen and then to be eaten by human beings. Um, or uh, if it manages to, to go through inland <clears throat> and then wants to go out again, it risks to be chopped by pumping stations. Uh, and, and all these different threats are now being uh, uh, taken up by the EU officially with legislation to trying to solve it. And, and that is what we, what we want to go forward. That's what we're looking for, this cooperation, cooperation to improve. And it's not only just for EU level or on that level, it's also about local initiatives going global. Um, for example, we, we, this is said more or less 10 years ago, a fantastic moment for myself and, and Herman and other people involved in this. Um, we have been working on this barrier. It's, an, uh, it's a major, major, dam in, in the Netherlands, 32 kilometers long, and <clears throat> it divides sea and fresh water. It's a really, really difficult to pass for migratory fish. And, uh, and, and we dare to say with this group of people, we said, let's make a hole in it. Let's make a gap in it. And that's not very popular in, in, popular in the Netherlands, making gaps in dams. Um, there are all kinds of reasons not to do it. For example, um, it's, it, they don't want uh, salt water to get into the fresh water, uh, is it safe, etc. All kinds of questions were raised and we managed to tackle all of those, came up with an innovative solution and now it is actually being built. We are building a fish migration river, as we call it, uh, onto, uh, onto this dam, uh, making a 24-hour open uh, opening. And it's costing 50 million euro, that's an incredible amount of money. Um, but if you really cooperate, apparently that's possible. And it's also in that spirit that we started also the Dam Removal Europe uh, uh, initiative. There were different people in different counties working on uh, removing dams on certain spots. And they, they found out that they can really learn from each other and they can also inspire each other. And, and you know, together you can make a bigger difference. That's why we organize this webinar. We want to, to make sure that the best practices are shared by people working in different countries, that we can add all information together about swimways and, uh, and together we can make sure that the world will be a better place for migratory fish. And of course, in the end also for people uh, 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 benefiting from that. So that is why um, we are uh, expecting a really nice session, I think. Um, Ruben, maybe it's time for you to take over again. Well, thank you, Arjan. Uh, that was very, very interesting. It's always great to hear how uh, the very small local 
um, movement has has really gone viral and global. It's very inspiring. Um, let me introduce the first uh, non the first guest speaker. Let's call him a keynote speaker for today's session. He's Jörg Freihoff. He's a scientist uh, in freshwater biodiversity, um, ecology, and ichthyology. Uh, currently, he works at the Museum für Naturkunde, the Leibniz Institute for Evolution, Biodiversity Science in Berlin. And he mostly focuses on bioeconomy. And on a more personal note, um, Jörg happens to be uh, ultimately one of the reasons that I'm sitting here today right now and uh, that I'm able to actually introduce him to you guys. Uh, we have been colleagues for a few years and um, I must say his office was always open for me when I had questions about fish life history or taxonomy because there's uh, no one better than Jörg um, in that respect. He has a million crazy and cool fish stories to tell. Uh, it's super fascinating, totally very educational to talk to him and he wrote, wrote several books and really has been an inspiration to me throughout my whole PhD. So thank you Jörg for joining in today. Um, I would like to, yeah, to start, to you to start your webcam, start your screen sharing, and um, please um, stay within your 10-minute time slot so we can use the remaining five uh, to answer all these questions that no doubt will come in. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's see. Do you see my screen? Do you hear me? Yes, we hear you just fine, but your screen uh, is not in uh, presentation mode yet. Not yes, this this I see. All right. All right. So my screen is in presentation mode. Uh, I hope so. Um, yes, it is. It is. So so thank you very much for your um, uh, and and I start right away. Is it? Yes, please. I would like you to start right away. <laughs> okay. So thank, thank you very much for inviting me to this very interesting webinar. Or thank you very much, Ruben, for the introduction. Um, yeah, my name is Jörg Freyhoff, and I'm he, I'm uh, actually based at the National History Museum of Berlin, where you also find my contact details and so on and so on. Um, I'm speaking to you today as the regional vice chair of the IOCN Species Survival Commission Freshwater Fish Specialist Group. This is this logo with the South American cichlid on it, or uh, about uh, Western Asia rivers and fishes. And if I'm correct, I have um, 10 minutes to talk to you. Uh, those are um, who have followed a bit the development in, uh, of rivers and fish in Western Asia might know the picture here seen in the background, or this is the Tigris River in Hassan Cave. Of course, an old picture because this scene is now gone uh, and has sunken in a very huge uh, hydropower uh, state plant. So in Western Asia, we are connected to several of the important biodiversity uh, hotspots which were already identified uh, many years ago as the most important places on earth for biodiversity conservation and in western asia you see we are in the eastern part of the mediterranean basin hotspot one of the most important hotspots and we work a lot on this then there is the Iranian Anatolian hotspot, and we are happy in this session to have uh, two speakers from the area um, to talk about Turkey and also to talk about Iran. We ha are involved in the Afro-Montane biodiversity hotspot, which is uh, from the hotspot linked to African things, from the fish uh, linked to um, uh, the Palearctic uh, things, and we also have a speaker about this. Um, and then we are have, of course, uh, also the Caucasus hotspot, which is uh, uh, involved in our region. Um, and we also have a speaker about that. And you see, of course, there are other important hotspots 
or in the world. So Western Asia, not so easy to define, or this is the borders, or one of the most important global biodiversity, some of the most important global biodiversity hotspots are here. Usually it has a poor or uh, fish fauna, highly endemic, especially poor in the Arabian Peninsula, just 31 species occur in this a huge surface area, which is uh, as big as India or other regions, especially in Turkey, the Caucasus and Iran are not as biodiverse in freshwater, when it comes to freshwater fish, or uh, let's say then uh, the Netherlands or Central Europe, uh, but we have many, many uh, endemic species in this region. And of course, the Western, Western Asia is known as one of the major disaster regions when it comes to climate change, water obstruction, hydropower and biodiversity loss. And you know, it's also not a very hot, much a hot spot of democracy um, and dam removal, I guess, is something uh, virtually un unknown to most people who work with rivers and fish uh, in that region. So uh, we, we did uh, several uh, red list assessments from our IUCN group for the region, especially from the Eastern Mediterranean, where we were able to include virtually all of the uh, uh, Euphrates and Tigris region to the area. We did the Caucasus, uh, we did our, um, the Arabian Peninsula. We have a recent study which will come out soon about the threatened fishes of the uh, Mediterranean biodiversity hotspot. And just this week, our, our new book on the fishes of the Arabian Peninsula uh, came out and can be ordered. So there is altogether actually recognized 625 uh, species of freshwater fishes. From these 16 are extinct. This is the stars you see, or it's not a very high number, 2.65%. Uh, uh, what means that more than 97% of all species of freshwater fish or are still extant and we are happy that uh, they are still all with us or but we have very high levels of threatened species what is mostly linked to many locally endemic uh, re and restricted species so the heat map of threatened species looks like this you see we have our high numbers of threatened species especially in the uh, or uh, in the Southern Caucasus, in the Kura and Aras area, in Western and Central Anatolia, in the Levant, and in the Euphrates and Tigris uh, river drainage. In Western Asia, is the, the phenomenon of locally endemic, highly threatened species is very strong. And this is also the same, and it's, it's a biogeographic connection to the same phenomenon in the Western Balkans and in Greece. And for example, in this uh, small uh, watershed, the Yidari Klar stream in Turkey, which is better known as the Kyrgyz drainage, we have just four native fish species and all four of them are endemic. And it's really a very tiny stream isolated since millions of years. And you can easily imagine, you just make one wrong local decision which have no impact at all somewhere. And here you can wipe out four species, species immediately. And it can look like this, like the Barada spring in Syria, uh, where these two species were um, still found dried on the floor of the spring, which had been pumped out completely and the water was taken directly from the underground. A famous spring, most maybe nobody of you knows it, but in the uh, old Arabic literature, it's close to Damascus, the beauty of this spring was praised and this is what is left. Um, migratory fish, of course, are a big issue, not as big as it is, as it is in Northern Europe. We have many um, within river migrants, or for example, these large uh, barbel species 
uh, all of them are threatened, but most of them are threatened, not due to dams, but they are threatened due to overfishing, uh, which is a major issue for these large fishes. The most important migratory fishes in Western Asia are, of course, sturgeons, or sturgeons are more critically endangered than any other group of fishes and or the IUCN sturgeon group has reassessed all the uh, West Palearctic sturgeons uh, last year again. So all our West Asian sturgeons are at a high risk of extinction. All of them are critically endangered and this makes them the most threatened groups of animals in Western Asia. All are at the border of being extinct in the wild and it's difficult to find out how many already have gone over this border and are completely dependent on um, breeding and stocking of them. And of course, dams and migration barriers had played a major role in this game, but this role has ended as virtually all the sturgeons are harvested or poached or however you want to uh, uh, call it, uh, mostly in the sea now. And indeed, we have to say the domestication seems to be the last chance to save the sturgeons, but sturgeons are on the other way also a conservation success story because none of the species is extinct. All of them survived somehow in captivity, and we know there's many in people engaged in reintroducing sturgeons to the wild to make the open the rivers for sturgeons. They are major umbrella species, and or in sturgeons, I must say, it can only go better now because we have really uh, reached the bottom, and there's many initiatives who are active to make it going better. Uh, one of the most important rivers in the West Palearctic is found in Western Asia. This is the Rioni River in Georgia, where obviously still several species of sturgeon spawn. And if there would be a key place for dam removal in Western Asia, this is the Rioni River where five hydro, uh, still Soviet time hydropower plants, very inefficient are taking off most of the water for a big stretch of the Rioni River, which could improve sturgeon spawning. But of course, also in this region, and you see this on a picture on the left, sturgeons are still poached. Everything's totally illegal, but they're still openly sold on the river and on the roadside where police cars pass along every day. Thank you very much for your attention. And there is many stories to talk about Western Asia. It's a fantastic place, very beautiful landscape, very beautiful rivers. And I tell you, most of the fantastic and fascinating biodiversity is still left and there can be done many, many cool things. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Jörg. Uh, I was almost a bit crossed with you after uh, these very sad stories about um, shrinking biodiversity without giving us a little bit of hope in the end, uh, but you managed to turn the boat, the ship around just perfectly. Thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. Um, I'm sure we have a lot of questions. Uh, Mark, could you please take over? Hi, Ruben. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your presentation. You were a very passionate speaker, so it was easy to follow. Thank you. Um, there are not much many questions yet coming in, so if you have a question, please uh, let me know. Still, I've got a question uh, myself. You were showing a graph with the uh, threatened species richness, um, uh, the density, and I was just wondering: is, it, is there a clear relation to human activities here? Can you can you show that uh, spatially? A uh, relation to what? To human so activities. Is is there a, a to, to human activities. Yes. But basically, the threats are, I mean, species are threatened because of threats. And threats are defined through human activities. Yes, yeah, sorry. So, if, if you can define but, certain human activities, is there yes. a definition? But, but, but indeed, or the, 
the, the major threats in the regions are over harvest. So there is a bunch, you see, basically the number of threatened species per hydrobasin, what is shown here is not very high. So we have no hydrobasin where there is threatened or uh, where there is 20, 30 threatened species. So it's always very few. And in the Euphrates and Tigris, we have overfishing as one of the major threats. So the big barbel species, which I show you, are mostly, are the triggers here and they are very much uh, threatened due to overfishing. And this, uh, here, this thing, there is some cave fish which are threatened by water extraction. And in most of the rest, so all of Turkey, except on the coast uh, of the Black Sea, water obstruction or, um, is the major threat. And you have there hundreds and hundreds of uh, water uh, storage dams. Basically every river, every water is taken in the area. Uh, very often directly after the spring or in the spring. So overfishing in the Euphrates and Tigris is a major thing. Uh, water obstruction and in the Aegean also pollution are major things. We have rivers, just to finish this, like the Küçük Menderes, which is the small Menderes River in the Aegean, which is virtually gone. If you go there, the water which flows there is pure sewage. No natural water is left because everything is taken from water for water retention dump for agriculture. And very fish, few fish survive in this river at all, usually in headwater streams which flow into reservoirs, uh, but they are densely populated, very much polluted. So hydropower dams especially play a role in this region in the Caucasus and in the Black Sea region where you have enough water and they are not a major threat in the Euphrates and Tigris River because we have very few long distance anadroma species and they are already all stopped in lower um, Shat al Arab area in Iraq. Did this answer your question? Yes, definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there room for another question, Ruben? Yes, let's do the quick one that I just saw uh, flying by, I guess, and then uh, maybe turn to the next speaker. Would that be okay with everybody? Yeah, well, the questions are really starting to get in, so maybe uh, you could answer some of them digitally afterwards. I will ask one more question. It's an interesting question. Are the potential dangerous effects on endemic species by non-native species? especially when you're removing migration barriers, which sometimes can have a positive effect by isolating. Uh, I, uh, yes, I, I know this phenomenon from Europe or where it's well studied, but in Western Asia, I'm not aware. Non-native species are a major threat. We are still not there where we are in Italy or in Spain and we, where we are going in the Balkans and in Greece. So Western Asia is not has not this culture of angling, uh, which uh, is so disastrous in our Southern Europe. Um, but most species, most extinct species have been driven to extinction due to alien species. So famous examples, the lake area in central Anatolia where stocking of pike perch has virtually wiped out our uh, whole faunas which then just survive in some inflowing streams, or, but some pelagic species, endemic species, were not able to survive and they went extinct. But alien species is a major driver and this will be very strong in the future because we cannot stop anglers to stock everything they want to angle. Thank you very much. There are many more questions in the Q&A. Uh, maybe if you find time, you can answer some of them. Uh, and Elsa, thank you very much for your, uh, for your input. You're welcome. Thank you, Jörg. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, I wish we could chat more about that, but uh, maybe some of the questions can indeed be answered during the next talks um, in writing. Um, the next speaker is uh, Devrim. I have never met her in person, and I'm therefore even 
more looking forward to hearing what uh, she's going to talk about. She's an aquaculture researcher and she's currently working at the Faculty of Aquatic Sciences at uh, Istanbul University. And uh, Devrim, if you're there, yes, yes I can yes. see your webcam. Um, if you start sharing your screen now, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. um, please try to stay within your time slot and we are very much looking forward to your talk. Yes. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ruben. And thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, you say uh, Fish Migration Foundation and uh, Organization Committee. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some migratory fish of Turkey uh, today. Um, uh, also, Jörg gave us uh, information about uh, our area. I want to thank you, uh, thank also Jörg. Uh, we have uh, 33 rivers with a total length of uh, 177.714 kilometers. Uh, Turkey, Turkey has uh, 25 river basin and uh, 80,333 uh, kilometer coastal line which is second longest coastline in the Mediterranean region. Uh, uh, we have a rich variety of fish species. There are 409 fish species and 31 families. Uh, 30, uh, 380 of uh, these are natural fish species. 194 are endemic in, in all inland waters, river, dam lakes, natural lakes, wetlands, etc. And uh, 186 fish species are common species. Uh, 20, 29 fish species in non-native uh, species in Turkey. Uh, also, our fish, 51.1% uh, of natural species are endemic. Uh, seven, 73 fish species directly or some reason are endangered in our river, uh, our uh, water uh, system. Four fish species uh, extinct, uh, unfortunately, and uh, 18 fish species is critically endangered. Uh, 38 fish species is endangered and se uh, 17 fish species vulnerable and 12 fish species near threatened. Some migratory fish species of Turkey, if you uh, look the slide, we have uh, many uh, fish species and uh, some of them anadrom species, uh, which I uh, talked about this uh, three species, uh, uh, important species, Aspensert, uh, and Salmo Labrax, and uh, Catadrom species, Anguilla, Anguilla. You can see another other migrate from lake river to river part, uh, Potomodron species also, we have a lot. First, uh, you can see our map, Black Sea uh, region. Uh, uh, on the uh, left side, uh, three point, uh, very important for the uh, sturgeon. Uh, especially Sakarya, uh, Yeşilırmak, uh, uh, Kızılırmak rivers, uh, former time. And then uh, right part, side of uh, east part of Black Sea region, uh, especially for sturgeon and uh, Black Sea trout. You can see is is Black Sea trout fish and, and uh, some uh, species Stellatus and will link that it, uh, from this area. Also, I want to tell you something about Mediterranean coast for uh, European eel. Um, this uh, fish is ca coming from the Mula region and uh, especially is uh, Büyük Mendres River. To, uh, they entered to this river and it goes to Bafa Lake. And uh, the second one, the Asi River, is Iskenderun Hatay region. Uh, they are still entering this uh, river. And then Antalya is a very important place for the uh, European uh, scientific uh, work. 
What about measurement? Our measurements and rules according to fishery law and its regulations by Minister of Agriculture and Forestry. Sturgeon, uh, 22 December 1996, uh, Turkey signed uh, CITES agreement and then all sturgeon species fishing are banned after 1 April uh, 1998. Yeshilmak River is a mayor river located on the middle part and Sakai River situated on the western part of the Turkish Black Sea coast. It's still used by species Stellat sturgeon, Russian sturgeon and beluga. Black Sea trout, Salmo labrax, is synonym uh, uh, Salmo chorihensis, fishing activity is banned whole year. European eel, we don't have fishery regulation, but according to CITES, there is a export quota for eel and determined as uh, 100,000 kilogram in 2020 by Ministry of Agriculture uh, and Forestry. We have many obstacles uh, and problem our river system and the life of migratory fish are threatened by human activities on river system. Human activities can be listed as illegal and overfishing uh, sand gravel extraction, water pumping from river to the another river, river follow regulation, water pollution, right wet of wetlands, recreational works, habitat loss, climate change, man-made barriers, especially this is important, set regulators, dam construction, hydropower plant, high levee where slices, bridges, and built a small lake using for drinking water, agriculture and electricity. The most important problem, I think, is uh, dam and taps on the uh, river system. Uh, for example, Choruf River and Sakaya River are located in the northeast and northwest of Black Sea region. Uh, there are many dams and hydroelectric power plants on the river basin, and because of this region, unfortunately has almost lost two important migratory fish species, black sea trout, salmon labrax, and sturgeon, which are uh, they Aspenser storio, Aspenser nudiventris, Aspenser bulenstetti, Aspenser stellatus, and huso huso. Uh, you can see uh, this uh, two uh, rivers and, and many uh, hep construction on the river system. The other biggest pro problems are urbanization, bridge, barrier, and lack of water because of heps and dams. You can see uh, this, this river, the Yeshilirmak River, and uh, sometimes uh, they face this without any water, uh, and then uh, you can see uh, river bottom sometimes, and then uh, other problem where is very high where and uh, and dams also another facility. If you are more focused on the heps, unfortunately, their their fish passage are almost inactive for fishes. You can see some uh, sample from uh, our heps uh, company uh, fish passage project. Uh, almost they are. Uh, inactive and, and they are not working, uh, even small fish. What are we doing? Uh, we have restocking program. This program managed by Minister of Agriculture and Forestry. Uh, they uh, have two directorate, the gen first uh, general directorate of fisheries and aquaculture, second general directorate of nature converse, conversation and uh, national parks. They, uh, they are produce uh, fish, uh, sturgeon, especially sturgeon, black sea trout, and release uh, every year uh, many uh, fry to the uh, their origin uh, river. For example, between 2010 and 27, 15 million black sea trout is released to the river where their nature living area. Some projects are managed also on uh, releasing, monitoring, and control by Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry and our university, Istanbul University, 
uh, aquatic science faculty. We, we used to, uh, for uh, trout, uh, black sea trout, visible implant elastomer tuck, and uh, T bar for sturgeon. And, and then uh, we released the, their river, this uh, tucked fish. And then we, we some social event for sturgeon and black sea trout uh, until today we did. Local people, especially and media, are informed about the releasing program when they released uh, them. And then uh, we did this facility with children and uh, local people and, uh, uh, and media together. Which projects are done are under, undergoing with sturgeon, salmonid, and uh, European eel uh, by Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry. If we talk about this project, we did a FAO TCP project, recovery of sturgeon population in Turkey, habitat assessment and restocking between 2008-2012, and published national action plan for the conservation and restoration of the sturgeon of Turkey in 2015. Uh, second one, habitat characteristic and population parameters of European eel in Kyrgyz, Belmenek Lagoon and uh, Dalaman Özlen River in Mula province uh, and uh, the other rivers which pour to Mediterranean uh, are added to the, this project and time extended. Culture also, culture of European eels under control condition in uh, Antalya uh, this uh, project also continued. And also restocking program for endemic salmon species are continue. If we say uh, results, uh, our river system are uh, important for the conservation of biodiversity. Uh, our priority should be river systems rehabilitation. We need improved fish passage design, some helps uh, or wear removal, improve political and poli public awareness and other solution. Migrate migratory fish needs a structural up approach to meet the conservation target in Turkey. Rule and le legislation should be determined as soon as possible by the policy ma maker in the revised fishery law in last year. We are waiting the regulation about the, this uh, this uh, problematic situation and then Ibrahim, solution. Thank please you. Please find into an end. Uh, fine. Uh, thank, you uh, thank you for you listening. <laughs> thank you, friends. Thank you. That was great timing. <laughs> yes. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Uh, that was totally unnecessary uh, for me to intervene. I apologize. Um, we are a little bit um, behind schedule, so. Um, please, uh, Mark, could you identify maybe one question right now that we could talk about? Yes, Ruben, thank you very much. Stephen, thank you very much for the presentation. I got uh, one interesting question on uh, the, the European eel. Um, in view of the worldwide eel decline, are there any plans to protect eel, you know, juveniles and adults in Turkey to for instance, to increase river basin escapement or fishing bans, similar things like on the, the European Union? Yes, we have already uh, fishing bans, uh, or some regulation, but not uh, enough for the protect of the migratory fish. And uh, we are waiting, especially, for example, a new revised uh, law, and then we are, uh, we are expecting uh, fish passage uh, program uh, in the in the law the the company they have to make fish fish passage but they are almost uh, uh, nothing and then uh, they have to uh, explain how to use this passage for mig migratory fish or, or river system because we a lot of uh, river small river big river uh, they have to make this regulation. We are waiting on um, this year, especially. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. And very shortly, what is the explanation of the term HEP? Someone Sorry? Knows. What is the explanation of the term HEP? H-E-P-P. -E uh, hydroelectric power plant. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, it was very interesting. Very interesting to hear that. Uh, also, in your uh, in your studies, it's just uh, coming down to the to the um, common problems that we face everywhere in the world. And yeah, hopefully we can do something about it together. Okay. Um, I would uh, like to uh, thank you very much and introduce the next uh, speaker, Nashat. Hi, Nashat. I see you're already online. That's fantastic. Okay. Um, Nashat is the head of Conservation Monitoring Center at the Royal Society for the Conservation of Nature in Jordan. And over the past 22 years, he has worked uh, to conserve critically endangered fishes and um, he explored the freshwater fishes of Saudi Arabia and studied behavior conservation and status of other species in Oman, uh, United Arab Emirates and Syria. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Um, your webcam uh, or your picture is a little bit dark. Uh, perfect, thank you. That's much better. Um, please start uh, sharing your screen at your earliest convenience <laughs> okay. and uh, try to stay within your 10 minutes. And we're looking forward to your presentation. Thanks for coming. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? We can't. Okay. Yeah, that looks good. Yes. And here's the presentation. Perfect. Yeah. You're ready to go. Okay. Uh, thank you. First of all, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, forever where you are in this world. It's nice to see you all meet you virtually in this uh, meeting. Today I'm going to tell you something about the unknown rivers of Western Arabia, where people think that Arabian Peninsula is all about uh, desert and sand dunes. But today I'm going to show you something different about the uh, Arabian Peninsula. So to start with, it's true that most of the Arabian Peninsula are desert high uh, elevation sand dunes sometimes reach for 400 meters elevation in the Rub al Khali, the empty quarter and Nufud Desert, but most of the ridges, especially the western, southern, and eastern ridges, are very rich environment. A lot of uh, rivers and water flows going down from east to west in the Red Sea, Oman Sea, Gulf, Arabian, Persian Sea, whatever, then the Arab Gulf. Anyway, then in terms of, if I'm going to talk to you about the freshwater fish of uh, the Arabian Peninsula, and mostly I will focus on the southern, uh, the east, with the western part of the Arabian Peninsula. That includes uh, about, th the whole Arabian Peninsula includes 31 freshwater fish described up to date, where 23 of them are endemics. And why we highlighted this species here in uh, this webinar because most of these endemics are either threatened, endangered, or even critically endangered. Some of them had only one or two records since described. And here I'm going just to update you briefly about what's found in this mountainous ridge of the Arabian Peninsula, the western side of Arabian Peninsula along the Red Sea coast. It's the Arabian shield, the Western Arabian shield is from Cambrian age, which is um, from 950 to 541 uh, million years ago, and known as Hijaz mountain. And this Hijaz mountain sometimes reach up to, as you see in this GPS, 2062, sometimes more, sometimes 2400, and you can find very nice uh, fast running rivers going down from east to west. This area is a piece of Mediterranean in the Arabian Peninsula. And if you go down and down toward Yemen, you will have the Asir Mountain, which has a lot of juniper tree that uh, uh, can be found on higher elevation of the Mediterranean uh, 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 geographical zones. The whole mountain ridge called Sarawat, and Sarawat is the local name of the whole east uh, western mountainous ridge of Arabian Peninsula. If you go to Taif, for example, you can see a very nice wadis. Wadis is the Arabic term of valley, uh, whether uh, continuous running or seasonal running or uh, stream. So wadis is somehow equivalent to small rivers. So in in Taif, there's a lot of 
wadis, river mainly like this one, the main one of Wadi Turaba. Then if you go south and west, you will have another Wadi Boa and Wadi Shumruk and Chogab. Then if you go south, you have a very nice combination of hot water with cold water and making very extreme condition of favorable uh, habitats for fish. And if you go to Medina Munawar, you have another running water in the middle of basalt volcanic uh, formation. But the system of the Arabian Peninsula is very fragile water ecosystem where you have water running connecting the whole wadi in some seasons. Then when it's dry, leaving behind some water batches. Imagine in this small water patch, we find very critically endangered fish still waiting for the fate, either to be reconnected again with the next flood or to dry and die. Then this fragile ecosystem really made the fish to be also very tough and they can swim either upstream, they can, they can swim in a very, very run, fast running water, they can uh, compromise the, the uh, environmental changes, they can find the very nice stagnant pockets at the time of flood where they can uh, lay their eggs, they can use the window time when it's very cold. So the main thing of this system because it's lays uh, within a very, very fragile ecosystem that the ecosystem is very tough for fish and they keep to be fighting to survive so that they are endangered and critically endangered. Uh, at the western part of Arabia, the site of a study, uh, we sampled the fish in the past six years and we only found eight species out of nine. And the funny thing that the most common species was not found in this survey. We found two very rare species. One of them is the Prim Acanthobrahma hadihensis. It was described in 1980 and only found re recently in 1914. So it's 30 years after being collected, same as for the Arabibarbus arabicus, another endemic species to the area. And uh, here I'm collecting fish from Wadi Turaba, and this guy, Dr. Mohammed Shubrak, is very thankful. He arranged everything for this uh, expedition. This is the um, this is the uh, Arabibarbus. It's very rare species. Was collected only 30 years after being described at the southern edge of the uh, eastern plate of Arabia, western plate of Arabia, and the other one is very rare, critically endangered bream, uh, Levantine element in the Arabian Peninsula, Akantu Brahma Hadiyahensis. This Wadi River is uh, seasonally flooded. So when water comes, it's flushed the whole Wadi. Then because of high temperature, the water is uh, um, evaporated, leaving behind very, very small amount of water. And it's dried, so you can sample fish easily if you be lucky and went to this dry, uh, shrinking uh, pockets. Otherwise, you will miss the chance and the whole fish will be dry. And it's a, ma a matter of survival strategy that they can stand very high temperature, very high, um, uh, uh, very low temperature and very uh, fast running water. Threats are the same everywhere. There is a lot of dams and recently even become more and more dams built in most of these uh, wadis to, uh, uh, to catch the run of water. And uh, when they have the dams, they initiate the lake of the dam, which is a very, very invasive friendly inf uh, environment. So there's a lot of people putting tilapia, Nile tilapia, gambusia, catfish, carp in these um, dams. So invasive species just leak down to the very fragile ecosystem. The good thing that they are not well adapted to such hard condition. So when it's flash flooded, most of these species, invasive species are eradicated, but still they can establish some uh, strong populations. Also water abstraction is another um, practice that has been used to uh, make water available for domestic use. Uh, with the time of uh, habitat, uh, habitat change for, eco for tourism, a lot of very fragile environments also change like this uh, Ain al Hama was the, the only site of very endemic Gara species, one of the Sibrinids fish were here. So they 
just canalize everything and make these ditches to facilitate people moving here and there. So they just take off all the breeding site, all the shallow shorelines to allow fish to breed like this. And it's been practiced all over the fragile ecosystems. Uh, that's all for this very short presentation. The hope that because these fish are very fragile, uh, very uh, strong to adapt, they will survive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nashat. Also, uh, thank you for staying uh, within your time slot. It was very, very interesting. I loved uh, the pictures. They are stunningly beautiful. I had no idea it looked like that. Um, makes me want to go. Uh, <laughs> Is there room for, is there one question that we can quickly answer and push the rest to the question and answer wrap up later? Sure, Ruben, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you were showing that building dams is, uh, is, is one of the main threats. Um, there's a lot of attention for, uh, for freshwater availability uh, for, uh, for humans. Um, can you say something about the balance between this policy for, for freshwater availability and efforts uh, to conserve freshwater migratory fish and the endemic species you were talking about. Yes, uh, there is really no um, migratory fish in, in the term you all understand, but these fish are moving between the wadis, either ancient movement because of geological formation and uh, how wadis or rivers was formed, or they are moved by the flash flood. All of these species I talked about are freshwater fish. They are all primary except of um, two species of secondary freshwater fish origin, so they can survive in the sea. But usually there is, uh, up to date, there's no real migration of freshwater fish in these uh, streams. Now the issue of water shortage in Saudi Arabia becoming very high because the they have all drinking water from desalinization, but they have a lot of rivers, running rivers, and a lot of flash floods. So they are trying to catch up this flash flood and use it for agriculture, for irrigation, for uh, domestic use. But still, uh, fish as a, as a item of biodiversity is not well considered in, in conservation, so that we are through our IUC and uh, developing this uh, issue to raise the profile of this species in the whole Arabian Peninsula countries. Thank you very much for your uh, answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you again. Um, maybe if you find a question that is easily answered in writing in the question box, maybe you can just uh, try to answer them during the next talks. Um, Otherwise, I would now like to hand over the floor back to Jörg. Um, Jörg, if you could start your camera and uh, start screen sharing. And um, I'm looking forward to your second presentation. Um, Nashat, thanks for joining in. Please uh, remember to mute your microphone, turn off your yeah, camera. You. And Jörg, the floor is yours. Thank you for your effort. I'm looking forward to your presentation. If this works out. Okay, that works. Okay, here we are. Yes, thank you. Uh, welcome again. Don't forget to full screen it. Uh, I have full screened it. Now you have. Perfect. Oh, yes, thank you. So, thank you again. Or I speak to you again. My name is Jörg Freyhoff and I'm based in Berlin at the National History Museum and I'm the regional vice chair of the IUCN uh, Species Survival Commission Wetland International Freshwater Fish Specialist Group. Uh, I speak here again about the Kura and the Aras River drainage uh, because uh, we as a specialist group try to support this uh, our global swimway initiative as much as we can and we tried also to find speakers from the region uh, but we had not been successful so this is why you see me here again. So we are in the uh, uh, Caucasus eco region in the Caucasus biodiversity head hotspot uh, which indeed falls into three 
uh, freshwater ecoregions, one of the northern Caucasus, the Kura Aras, which I speak uh, about now, and in the Caspian Sea Basin and the or um, adjacent Black Sea Basin or ecoregions. Eco um, so the, the Caucasus ecoregion is one of the most important global biodiversity hotspots and the Kura is the longest river of the Caucasus. The Aras is the main tributary of the Kura and while both are seen uh, usually together, <clears throat> interesting, uh, both of them have quite a, a certain rate of endemism, so species uh, which occur only in the Kura or only in the Aras, what indicates a long-term isolation of both rivers as independent. Uh, so they, the Kura and the Aras are basically the rivers of Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, uh, and small parts of Turkey and uh, also of Iran. So they contribute uh, to most of the runoff in the region uh, and they are typical mountainous rivers. So they have high water levels after the snow melt in the Caucasus and have low water levels in autumn and in the winter region when the snow is then uh, still in the mountains up. So in the Caucasus ecoregions, or there is 162 species of freshwater fish and four species of lampreys. And in the Kura Aras, which is really the core of this, is 85 species of freshwater fish and one lamprey. 16 species are endemic to the region. And uh, most interesting, there is indeed an endemic genus of uh, leucistine fishes, which you see here on the upper picture. This is Loic alburnus saturnini, and it's not even just endemic to the Kura River, but it's endemic to a very small uh, Altiplano streams in the upper Kura in Turkey. So it's not found in adjacent Azerbaijan, uh, Armenia, so but only in Turkey. And there is also a second species endemic to the same region, which is Oxenemachilus Zyri, both endemic to the uppermost Kura in Turkey. And what I found very interesting, both are not threatened because it's such a flat area the, and so uh, weakly populated by humans that uh, there is no threats. You cannot even build a hydropower dam because it's just a flat area. So sometimes these gems and uh, treasures are really placed at the, best pla at the best places where you can hardly impact them. Or the most important migratory fishes of the Kura Aras are the fishes, of course, which go more or less regularly to the uh, Caspian Sea Basin. There is the Caspian Lamprey, Caspian Muson Wagneri, or uh, there is uh, Albonus Charcoides, Rutilus Lacostris, uh, Rutilus Friesi, or Alosa uh, Kesslery, and of course also the sturgeons, which traditionally and still migrate uh, from the Caspian Sea to the Kura and Aras rivers as far as they can. Or except the sturgeons and the lampreys and the, the alosa, so the, the leucistines, or they have uh, very often also landlocked populations and uh, some of them as the sturgeons and also as uh, um, the kutum, rutilus frisi, are more or less completely conservation dependent because they have uh, lost virtually all of their spawning sites. Um, <clears throat> Some of them have landlocked populations like this uh, Lucio barbus brachycephalus, uh, which is a highly threatened species in the Caspian Sea Basin. Very, very few population remains uh, because they are a victim first of dams, which block the access to their spawning sites, and then they are big and people like to eat them, so they are also a major victim of overfishing. And interestingly, this theoretically is Anadromos migratory barbel has its biggest population landlocked in the Azerbaijani Mingeshivir reservoir. I hope I pronounced this correctly, or 
where it was isolated when they built the dam and from which it now migrates to the rivers and where it's more or less uh, still present. So the area is not very well studied for freshwater fish. We have just our, a paper in press about the checklist of the freshwater fishes of Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia by a nice team of uh, regional experts. Last year we had the IUCN um, red list workshop uh, in Tiflis, in Tbilisi, in Georgia. You see all the uh, great experts bringing their knowledge together. Uh, parts of the area had been already studied in our uh, um, great effort to assess the status and distribution of freshwater biodiversity in the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, WWF engages a lot in the areas also for hydropower and freshwater fish, and there have been some studies within this framework. Um, there is relatively low number of threatened species because we don't have this phenomenon uh, of very many locally endemics. So there is three extinct species, one Rutilus, which was just known from few springs in Azerbaijan, which is gone, or two of the four or um, Lake Sevan trout, you know, Lake Sevan is a big lake in Armenia, which had been or uh, suffered major impact. Uh, the water level, for example, has been dropped 80 meters and there was four uh, trouts in the lake. Uh, two of them are completely gone and the other two are uh, com uh, completely conservation dependent. If you would not stock them and breed them, they would be gone. And there's also one uh, spined loach which is, which is extinct. Then we have all the sturgeons, or uh, also eel occurs in the area, but uh, very rarely, most likely entering the area through canals from the northern Caspian Sea. And then we have a bunch of endangered and vulnerable species, or I will tell you something more about this, because this is something what also came out for me as a surprise during the red list assessment, or these are not the classical anadromous migratory species. They are migratory species, but on a, let's say, regional level, or where they migrate a bit up and down their streams. Um, they are may obviously major victims of recent hydropower development, especially of many, many small dams which are built in the region or uh, all over, or uh, and you you might be aware the major impact of the dam is not necessarily the blockade of the migration route, but it is the destruction of the river ecosystem and the transformation of the river ecosystem into a reservoir, so a lake-like environment, which is then no longer suitable for these rheophilic fishes. So if you transfer the, the flowing river into a series uh, of uh, more or less standing lakes, this eliminates most of the species which you show here on the upper is uh, Lucibarbus mursa, Lucibarbus uh, capito, Romano gobio, Macropterus, uh, Copitis amphilecta, Chondrostoma on the right column, Chondrostoma zyri, Acanthobrama microlepis, uh, Rutulus at atropatene and Subdanievia caspica. The last two are, are endemic to wetlands in the lower area which suffer from other threats. So also here we have of course a distribution of uh, threatened species of the whole region and you see the, the highest threat levels are of course for migratory sturgeons or uh, which in the Georgian part or uh, in the Black Sea part are still present but which only occasionally enter still the Kura and it's not clear if they uh, spawn regularly at all, most likely is just occasional visitors and all spawning has finished. So what you see, we can identify areas uh, of high importance for threatened species. And uh, while we talk about dam removal, I mean, it's the same story a bit 
uh, Ruben said it's a sad story, but I mean, what to say? Uh, you see, we have also here, this is just uh, Georgia and only a part of it. The Eastern part is for the Kura. We have, of course, p uh, the uh, demand for electricity is high and uh, there is many plans to build new hydropower dams. But except for the sturgeons, I would suspect that none of the threatened species will go extinct, even if all of these dams will be built. Fish are quite resilient when it comes uh, to uh, human impacts. And basically this, this uh, region will follow the pathway of Central Europe where we uh, destroyed everything in the 20th century and nobody cares for biodiversity or uh, they will survive this. And so it will be a big job creator in 20, 30, 40 years to remove all of these dams uh, and restore all of the rivers. Um, if you travel to the region, hydropower uh, building is very active, or you see it everywhere. The, this, uh, especially small hydropowers, um, and this is all I can tell you, and I want to tell you in this very short time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jörg, uh, for that sobering and educational talk again. Um, you have made one very, very good point, though, that I also wanted to mention, and that's the problem, the threats that hydropower plants um, not just uh, pose a migration barrier, but really um, absolutely uh, change the, the natural discharge regime. And um, this is a threat that is absolutely very very real and that people really like to overlook um i'm not sure we have time for a question right now but if there's questions uh, maybe you can start answering them in writing again if yes. there's time uh, later at the wrap up we would like to get back to you with one or two um and uh, otherwise i would like to ask tarek to uh, continue with the, with the next talk if that's okay um, Tarek, are you there? If yes, please turn on your microphone and your camera. Hello everyone, okay. can you see me? Yes, we can see you, we can hear you. We can't see your screen though. Well, I, I can do the screen. I just wanted to make sure that it's my turn because uh, the schedule included another uh, uh, esteemed uh, colleague or is it my turn already? Um, yes. So if, if it was if it was okay with you, we are missing one speaker. So um, if you could jump in right now, that would be absolutely perfect. My pleasure. Let me just scroll back to the beginning of my talk. Fantastic. Apologies for this. Um, okay, guys, I'm really happy to be here with you. My talk is going to also be short. Um, I'll uh, I'll be talking again with my good colleague Nashat from the same organization for. Uh, we're splitting the 10 minutes, uh, five minutes each. Uh, I'll be uh, uh, making an introduction uh, uh, around the Jordan River Basin. And, it's, and uh, uh, please don't forget to share your screen. I did share it, so let me just check again. Okay. And please tell me if it's working. So we're there we go. Okay, that looks and fantastic. And the full screen Yes, we can see your screen now. Uh, don't forget to go in full screen or in presentation mode. Good. All right, you're ready to go. Excellent. So I'm just going to jump in. Nashat and I will be splitting this presentation. I'm going to give an overview from where uh, I'm specialized, and then Nashat will continue on the specificities related to the fish conservation. Uh, again, we are very happy to be with you guys. And you know, just to remind you where we are in the world, you know, this is lit, lit, little hot uh, red spot, <laughs> which is uh, not uh, maybe surprising for everyone. Uh, it is a very hot spot for ecosystems, for biodiversity, but also sadly for a lot of conflicts in the world. So, uh, you know, we do have major challenges in our region uh, in regard to managing our ecosystems and diversity. But we believe that, you know, from crisis and from conflict, you know, uh, hope can rise and can and prevail and take over, you know. And this is maybe a good picture to start with, you know, although Jordan is a very uh, poor country in terms of water resources, but it's still, you know, within this 
a harsh, you know, dry-looking landscape. You can still find a lot of life associated with the with the with the beautiful freshwater rivers, uh, 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 streams that are, you know, they are carving it that have been carving it uh, for millennia. Uh, there are in Jordan. Uh, I just want to share with you that in Jordan, you know, at least from the area associated with the Jordan River, you know, Jordan has 13 vegetation types or ecosystem types, and one of them is uh, a freshwater ecosystems, which, you know, the Jordan River represents a, a primary component of. Uh, I would like to also say a few words related to the organization that I work for. You know, I work, Nashat and I work for the Royal Conservation, uh, the Royal Society for the Conservation of Nature uh, in Jordan. It is an NGO, but, you know, surprisingly, maybe for some of you it will be a surprising to know that this NGO is actually mandated in a very unique setting, institutional setting by the government of Jordan to run, establish, and manage protected areas in the country. And it has a very uh, important uh, role in um, the management of biodiversity and the enforcement of laws and to raising awareness and to securing sustainable resources for the, 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 the management of these resources. So, you know, RSCN actually primary uh, work area is establishing protected areas. There are 10 uh, protected areas that are, are, that are managed by the, by, by, the, by the organization. It includes oh, the, uh, representation from the various landscapes and the ecosystems of the country, you know, the, the deserts, you know, the, the forests, the, the water systems, uh, as well as, you know, the, the lowlands, you know, associated with the with the uh, with the with the deposition uh, of of the rivers, so uh, th this is uh, one thing about RCN. Another very important thing for you to know about RCN is it is highly involved in species conservation programs, and it has a large uh, uh, program uh, led by Dr. Nashat, uh, my colleague, who is uh, also with us today. And uh, this includes, you know, the various uh, taxa uh, from fauna and flora. Uh, in the various regions. You know, RCN is the national entity in charge of uh, the CITES. It is the national entity in charge of the wildlife hunting uh, regulation and legislation enforcement. It also has a, a major pioneering role in the development of ecotourism and nature-based tourism in the country. Now, the Jordan River, this, I don't really have to say much about the Jordan River. It's you know, maybe one of the most iconic rivers in the world. The Jordan River is the longest permanent river in the region, with around 250 kilometers flowing freely from the, for thousands and thousands of years from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea. The Jordan River, you know, uh, sadly today is not the Jordan River that we used to know, you know, half a century or a century before, because formerly it was a lush wetland ecosystem rich in biodiversity. It still holds some of that until today, but sadly because of the major transformation that took place in, in, the, uh, in its, uh, uh, you know, uh, hydrological construct, it has actually lost uh, more than 90% of its natural uh, uh, ecological fl water flow uh, during the last, uh, you know, five or six decades. Uh, although this is very uh, challenging and very, very uh, saddening for most people, but it's still, you know, the Jordan River is very important uh, uh, from a cultural point of view. It represents a major and an iconic, uh, you know, uh, uh, part of the monotheistic uh, faith, and it is definitely immortalized in their in, in, in uh, the Divine Holy Box. This is a picture from the baptism side, the Jordanian side of the Jordan River, which so many people, you know, uh, my, uh, you know, uh, pilgrims, so many pilgrims approach the area to, you know, to practice their rituals and to, 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 to fulfill their faith. Uh, the Jordan River is definitely, uh, uh, so remain, remains so important for, some, for so many of the, of the people of the world, you know, uh, uh, so it, it definitely should be in the center of, of, of the conscience of humanity because it, it means just so much for us from, a, uh, from, a, from a, uh, a natural and from a cultural point of view. And it's definitely a cultural landscape of a universal, uh, universal significance. The, 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 the Jordan River is still definitely one of the, uh, the hotspots for biodiversity in, uh, uh, in, in the region. And you know, it, it includes a wide variety uh, uh, as it uh, trickles down from the north to south, uh, you know, pouring and discharging in the Dead Sea, uh, uh, you know, going through a wide variety of, of natural habitats and including a lot of the, their representative uh, species. I'm going to stop at this stage and, and hand uh, over the microphone back to my colleague Nishat, 
and then uh, uh, you know Nasha could take on the discussion related to uh, the, the the fish uh, ecology and uh, what and, and the related aspects uh, more most related to this webinar. Thank you very much, Nasha. It's your turn, please. Thank you, Tarek. Next, please. Uh, okay. Um, uh, as for in the thank you, Tarek, for this. Uh, just a very few minutes left uh, for the freshwater fishes of uh, Jordan River. You know, the conflict, um, Arab Israeli conflict, is now become almost 70 years old. So literature on freshwater fish of Jordan River is very old, and uh, research activity is very restricted. But in general, there is a few species described late. Uh, early by 1990 is the last update, 1989 by, by Krobe and Schneider. Next, please. And to do research, even very small research, you have to be surrounded by uh, police and uh, border guard and explain everything to them that you, what you need to do and you can't go at night, you can't go at day and you only have very few minutes to sample water and leave. So research is very restricted because of the political situation at the border and because of uh, Safety-wise, some mines are drifted with, uh, by flash flood, so they are not allowing anyone to sample fish from uh, this side, especially with uh, electrofishing gears and uh, physical existence in the river. Next, please. So basically, the uh, but the river tributaries are well well studied and uh, identified, like this in Jordan in the red circle. So there's a lot of uh, river really drain to the Jordan River, mainly the Zarka River, which is one of the biggest and uh, fast fl flowing uh, river in Jordan. Includes a lot of uh, endemic uh, species, either to the mainly to the basin. Next, please. So there's 25 native species, including the very nice um, um, Barbus canis, for example, or Gara jordanica, or Oxynomachilus insignis, most of which are unknown status at the river itself. In addition, there's a lot of invasive species also are not evaluated in the river, and some of them are the top worst. Next, please. It threats mainly the discharge of the river. It was really dramatically reduced even to be almost zero. It was reduced from 1.3 billion cubic meters a year to 20 to 30 million, million cubic meters a year, which is really uh, disconnect the river from everywhere. And as you see, some parts of the river are uh, uh, paved, so most of the habitats are destroyed. Even the river is very polluted by agriculture and domestic water discharge. And more than 50% of its aquatic biodiversity was lost and extinct, including some endemic species like the Gary snails. And these photos are very explanatory for itself. You have the koibo and the catfish. Both are the worst invaders and they are freely living in Jordan River. A lot of pesticides are drained to Jordan River, so it caused the death of some aquatic uh, species. Next, please. So with all of this very hard political situation, the hope is may exist, uh, like to adopt the basin uh, wide region approach and to enable eFlow uh, uh, concept to just to sustain the river and its biodiversity and to ensure the well-being for people and their holistic relationship with this river. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nash'at. I'll, uh, I'll uh, now stop uh, the video and uh, uh, back to you, Robin. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Tarek. Thank, uh, thank you, Nash'at. Um, thank you. My pleasure. I'm, uh, I, I realized that I didn't even introduce you, uh, Tarek. You are um, a serious professional with uh, more than 25 years of experience in Jordan um, and Jordan uh, community-based management of protected areas. So you really know what you're talking about. It's very, very impressive. Uh, I have a lot of respect for what are you guys doing, um, given the difficulty in, in which you carry out your work. It's, uh, it's crazy. It's crazy to hear. Um, very impressive. 
Um, we do not have um, a replacement speaker for the one that's unfortunately that couldn't make it today. So um, we will have time for an extended Q uh, and A session that we would just like to carry out right now. Um, please ask away your question, questions, Mark, uh, if you could take over that part. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to a lively discussion. Thank you. Yes, hi everyone, thank you very much. And in relate to the last presentation, um, I noticed that people were quite impressed of the situation, this research is taking place. Um, and, and there were, but I was interested to, more, more, to know more about the effects of the political situation on the work you're doing, how you can do with this. So just also, um, well, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this and how you can deal with the situation uh, like this and how you are coping with it. So that's a question for uh, uh, Tarek. And uh, please, please unmute yourself, Tarek. Yes, thank you yes. very much. Sorry for that. Uh, we're still learning to, you know, in this global crisis, how to deal with the, you know, distance learning and conferencing. So apologies, but you know, you know, in a region like this, you know, we don't have Moses to, you know, with his uh, big stick to, you know, to to, to solve problems. Uh, but you know, uh, we believe that you know we have to apoliticize the, the the environment. You know, we need to work with it on this like humans. This is why we. We are, you know, the, from academia point of view, from a, a non-government organization point of view, we're we're open to to deal, you know, in a, you know, to cooperate in a more regional, to share information and knowledge, while at the same time also, you know, speak very openly and, uh, you know, through a constructive dialogue on on how to deal with our challenges and and, and you know the crisis that we're facing. You know, we can disagree and we can maybe have conflict, but it's it's really sad that you know this conflict is not it doesn't have a platform for discussion. What we how we're dealing with it is that every uh, you know, every country is trying to do their best to to solve the problem from their side, and then somehow try to learn how the others are doing it, and somehow, you know, uh, virtually sometimes, and sometimes also physically, try to cooperate and and try to share information so we can come up with something collective. The, the situation these days is is at uh, lowest uh, positivity, so we have to really work in very harsh conditions, but hope uh, we have to keep hope. Otherwise, we cannot continue. Thank you. Thank you very much for this answer, uh, Tarek. I hope uh, this is an answer to the people who asked the question. Um, I got another question for uh, your previous uh, presentation. Um, you mentioned that uh, building these uh, gems that are planned, uh, you expect that they um, will not affect the survival of most of these fishes. Um, and I got some questions on what makes you really sure that these fish will survive uh, the dams that are being constructed in so many places. Um, and also, is, is there another effect to be expected besides uh, um, survival being extinct? Is there another expect, uh, effect to be expected on maybe the population uh, uh, density or um, well, how these species will evolve themselves? I hope this is a question is clear enough. Yes, thank you very much for the, the question. Um, of course, this is a, let's say, a very general uh, discussion. Um, of course, dams change the environment. They change the age structure, they change the population structure, they change the abundance of fishes, and so on and so on. But uh, speaking from experience, to finish the last population, is not easy. So a river like, let's say, like the Kura Aras, it has many small tributaries, it has many streams, many places, and it's not, at the end, it's not, and, and this is the same what happened in Central Europe. We have built hundreds, thousands, and so on of dams. Look, or look at Spain, how many dams they have built. But at the end, fish survive this somehow. Yeah, the, this is a, a, a completely change of the biocenosis. Yeah, but to, to really finish the last population is not easy. And usually it happens then in association with alien species. We should 
we should not forget dumps have many uh, this is not just blocking the migration it's just let's say an imp a ma an impact for very few species and it's uh, all of the research on dumps or most of the research have focused on this but dumps totally change the environment and dumps are the uh, entry place for alien species invasion only a high voltage or fence around the reservoir can stop anglers to introduce alien species and this is what we see everywhere you build the dams and then somebody make has a business idea to create a holiday place for german anglers to catch uh, zilurus catfish which they introduce there and this development we see everywhere in turkey they build a dam or some and they have a reservoir and they stock carbs and of course then a bunch of wheat in algeria we have a hungarian fish fauna in algeria because they have a contract with an algerian company uh, with a hungarian company to stock fish in every dam they construct and these fish of course naturalize in the river and they invade the whole system and they are able to finish the, the native species but it's very few examples but you cannot build an, in my opinion you cannot build enough dams to to bring the fishes to extinction even the sturgeons i'm i'm very con uh, very sure if we would have no uh, harvest and fishing of sturgeons all the dams would not have brought the sturgeons into a situation where they are today they would still spawn in huge numbers below the lowermost dam but at the end we fish them out yeah and you know there is a zero quota for sturgeon since many years but you know that the same people who have fished in the quota uh, before are still now fishing all is illegal and this is the threat. The dams are not, they, are, they cannot finalize the things, in my opinion, so easily. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a very interesting, uh, interesting view. And I get a lot of responses also from people that say that the related uh, issues from them, like you were saying, so river alteration, stream alteration, introduction of, uh, of uh, alien species. Um, well, it's, it's, it's not just, to them blocking the, the fish migration route, and but there are many other issues uh, around it. So thank you very much for this uh, for this answer. Um, then I got another question for uh, for the Vim Mimis. Um, I hope you're still around. The question uh, I got for you is um, whether illegal fishing and bycatch in Turkey are also a problem, and is there any data on this? Or is the loss of access to spawning habitats a main problem? Devrim, could you say anything on this? <clears throat> yes, by catch. Still, uh, for example, uh, about sturgeon, we have many story, uh, especially Yeshilirmak, uh, Sakaya River. Uh, sometimes fishermen catch uh, even small fish. Uh, for example, three, four years ago, we found a uh, small 25 gram uh, stellatus fish in the river, uh, Sakaya River. And, uh, but uh, after uh, the um, information, uh, local people especially, uh, people release, uh, if, uh, but if find, uh, catch the small fish, release them again in the uh, river or Black Sea. But a uh, big fish, for example, uh, sturgeon, uh, impossible to release them again. They catch and then uh, sell uh, uh, unofficially, of course. And uh, yes, we have uh, also uh, about uh, black, uh, black sea trout. One river open for uh, this fish, uh, especially east uh, coast, uh, uh, black sea coast. Uh, Fortuna River, uh, name is Fortuna River, still they are uh, coming into the river. Uh, but aquaculture facility uh, uh, nowadays is one very popular. Uh, Freyov also said, uh, especially carp, after them uh, or a uh, head of power uh, plant, they stop the uh, cultured uh, carp. 
uh, unfortunately, and then change our their uh, ecosystem, uh, fish species, uh, maybe after the releasing. Uh, this is the problem. I think I I agree with the York. Uh, damn problem, but uh, releasing or invasive fish is uh, more than problem the uh, for the ecosystem. I think yes. Okay, thank you very much for this answer. There was another question for you actually. You just uh, in your presentation you showed uh, a slide where you saw several fish waves being uh, placed around dams, and you clearly showed that some of them were not functioning uh, well or at all. Um, the question is whether this this mitigation for fish migration is obligatory obligatory and uh, whether the functionality of the fishways is also being monitored or is just building a fishway the only thing that gets uh, uh, checked? Yes, for me. <laughs> uh, fish pass is problem, yes. And, and uh, they are almost in inactive. Uh, and then now uh, this uh, government uh, ministry of agriculture of forestry did the new uh, regulation and then uh, they have to uh, if the impossible to uh, upstream uh, goes to upstream for this fish they uh, collect the fish then uh, <clears throat> move to uh, them uh, for example they uh, they are thinking that this rule <clears throat> Uh, yes, we have to find solution about this passage design, uh, especially, uh, for example, uh, if the big fish, the, the use this river, uh, this passage design uh, according to this, uh, this fish stock, or if small fish, uh, we can design the according to this uh, fish population. Uh, our uh, fish passage design very important. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know if it's okay. Yeah, well, I, I, I do. I did was is wondering whether um, uh, when after after these uh, these fish passage are being uh, built and placed, is there still uh, uh, an oblig obligation to to uh, the ones that control the dams or? The fish waves to, to show that it's actually functional, or is it just building the dam? Is that enough? Oh, sorry, building the fish waves that enough for them to show that they actually mitigate it? So yes, in, 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 in law, they have to put the fish passage, uh, correct this fish passage in the, their uh, plant, uh, their uh, power plant, but uh, uh, unfortunately. They, they they don't use this rule. They put just fish uh, passage and then they unfunctional uh, all of them. And then uh, I think our problem control, control system is not uh, good uh, going in Turkey. It's, it's love, no problem, but control problem. Well, thank you for this answer, and I think it's it's a general problem in a lot of other locations as well. Mm -hmm. uh, after actually building a, a fish way, fish ladder, uh, how to make sure it will be functional in the long term as well. So thank you for sharing that uh, experience. You're welcome. Then uh, maybe a final question. Um, I think it's another question for, for Jörg, actually. Um, there was a, a more general question. You were talking about hydropower, um, and Thomas was asking a question: Is there any way to to make functional mitigation for downstream migration uh, um, uh, for hydropower dams in your opinion? So there are, of course, maybe ways to mitigate these these hydropower dams, but do, are you aware of functional measures that has been taken? Uh, when when hydropower plants are built that are functional for for downstream migration for downstream migration yes I must say that I'm not an expert in this uh, I everybody talks about upstream migration but downstream migration is of course a major issue not only in eel 
or but also in Salman and others. But I'm I'm not an expert, so I okay. know man, that many people have worked on this, but I I'm not I don't know what is the state of the art here. Maybe I can jump in uh, quickly. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of downstream migration measures uh, developed and studied and um, a very or rather efficient means seems to be um, a fine screen uh, that is a mechanical barrier for the fish uh, to be deflected from the turbine that is not in a 90 degree angle to the approaching stream floor but a very very or like more rather like that a shallow one um, so the fishes don't just get squished, squished uh, at the at the tr at the screen, and then they are guided to a downstream bypass that is ideally accessible across the whole water column. A lot of hydropower plants have bypasses that are, you know, in theory operational, but fishes don't find them because they are only at the surface of the of the um, of the approaching flow and um, the, that's more like the counterintuitive mo um, movement or the counterintuitive direction where a stressed uh, or scared fish would would flow. A lot of them actually dive down and if there's no entrance to a bypass then they won't find it obviously. And then there's also um, behavioral barriers like louvers or bar racks that fishes would in theory be able to pass but they don't and this is actually even more efficient and that in combination with a with a state-of-the-art bypass that it's that is accessible can um, migrate can successfully uh, transport quite a big chunk of fishes downstream well thank you very much for this addition uh, uh, Ruben um, I think most of the questions that have been uh, asked are, are answered. Um, so I want to thank everyone a lot for the essence, uh, essence questions that you've asked. Um, there are some contact details, so if you have any more questions, just uh, please reach out to the different speakers and we will uh, set these different presentations online as well. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, uh, Mark, for handling uh, all these questions. Um, I would like every speaker of this session to turn on their webcam one more time so we can see all the faces that have been here today and that have talked. Um, maybe also including the support team, Mark, the question manager, uh, Roxanne, the chat manager, um, and maybe even our host who has been in the background the whole time so please just throw your faces for a few minutes while I just summarize quickly what we have uh, talked and what we have heard today so uh, thanks again thanks for all your patience the first um, presentation we had today was Jörgs and he talked about the fascinating biodiversity hotspots all across the globe and um, I found it very striking that most threatened species are also highly endemic. And this is actually very, very dramatic because they don't have global coverage. There's no global interest in these species. So they are, so there's, there's not really uh, a big incentive to actually do something about that um, unless it's for very passionate biologists like Jörg. Uh, so Devrin made a point of um, emphasize, yeah, she emphasized that, that dams and hydropower plants are the most important or the most critical uh, reason for biodiversity incline and this is something that we have heard a lot today um, and uh, she also said this is something i want to emphasize that just the migration barrier alone isn't the big issue but the artificial flow regime that results from blocking a river is so this is something to keep in mind um, nashat was next he talked about these very, very crazy, small, interesting, um, beautiful rivers with these highly resilient species or resistant species, if I understood that correctly, that was fascinating to see. And I'm sure uh, there's a lot of opportunity for very interesting taxonomy and evolutionary studies there. It's super cool to see. I'm very, very uh, happy that I, that I could follow this talk. Um, yeah, Jörg uh, was after that and he also emphasized that the power plant itself 
does not eradicate the species to the fullest, to the uh, eventually, ultimately. Um, I'm, I think what we all could, could agree on in this very uh, difficult discussion is that we have multiple pressures and these multiple pressures are, even, are eventually the reason why, why species uh, go extinct. It's, it's really just the one that we can pinpoint. Um, Tarek uh, talked about um, the interesting fieldwork in Jordan and uh, Tarek mentioned that water abstraction is a very, very big threat uh, to, to species. And this is also something that people um, tend to forget, um, especially in the context of hydropower plants. Uh, water abstraction can be a reason why, why species can go locally extinct. And uh, I think we should all memor um, uh, memorize that we can't just do whatever we want and utilize a resource like water, what, however we want, without um, without fearing the implications and consequences. And uh, I'm very, very happy that we are all here today and uh, share the insights um, of everybody's um, research and work. And I'm very, very happy uh, that you all gave the presentation. I was following it, and I would now turn over to uh, Aryan again, who's going to finish with his words. Thank you very much. Yeah, Ruben, thank you very much. Um, well, let's not keep on thanking each other all the time, but I mean, it's really, uh, really nice again. And so, so nice that you uh, have been moderating us. And thank you all the speakers on behalf of the World Fish Migration Foundation. Um, and um, I just want to take the opportunity also to thank our sponsors because we need them to do what we do, of course. And there's a whole lot of them, as you can see. Um, I really want to thank them all and, and for the support. They are all supporting us for World Fish Migration Day and it's much appreciated. And um, I believe I can also say that on behalf of these pieces, right? That's what we're doing it for. Um, and now I would like to close this session officially with a um, song. As you might know, in Europe, we organize a Eurovision uh, Song Festival every, um, I don't know, actually every two years or anyway, now and then. And um, uh, this year it is not going on on the 16th of May because of the COVID situation, but we decided to organize, organize a Eurovision with songs about migratory fish. Several people have sent in some, some really, really nice songs. We've put it on the website and from Saturday, the 16th of May, you can also vote. So please do so, that is fun. At least that's what I think and what we think. And um, let me now select one of the songs. There are many, many songs, but I select, have selected one to listen now as end of this session. Thanks a lot for joining. Um, we're going to start now a Shanti. Um, uh, I hope you enjoy it. And I hope I see you also in the next session. Swim with me, oh swim. Swim to the sarcasm, see by oh, the time of weeds and mysteries that spread through the rivers and streams.